task force set up by the Union Finance Minister uh, to come up with a comprehensive plan for the National Infrastructure Pipeline uh, submitted its report recently, in fact on uh, uh, Tuesday of the last week. And I had the opportunity to go through this uh, report of the task force, fairly voluminous, detailed work that has been done by the task force. Uh, the National Infrastructure Pipeline Task Force has outlined uh, projects across various sectors, road, rail, airports, social infrastructure, health, education, uh, for the financial year uh, 2021 till financial year 2024 to the tune of a massive op crore rupees actually. So that's the kind of money that the government says that it plans to spend on the infrastructure <clears throat> uh, in, in, order, in order to propel the Indian economy to the fri uh, 5 trillion uh, mark that this current government has set itself uh, up against. To discuss this national infrastructure pipeline, the feasibility of some of the ideas outlined in the national infrastructure pi pipeline, the, fina the financing model, everything, we have one of our best public policy commentators who has written copiously on various infrastructure sector, Ashish Chandorkar here. Ashish, uh, really wonderful to have you on the show and uh, look forward to uh, discussing with you about the National Infrastructure Pipeline over the next 20-25 minutes. Welcome to the show, Ashish. Thank you, Prasanna, for having me. Yeah. Uh, Ashish, uh, well, let's get into the uh, crux of it, actually. So, I, uh, when I was reviewing the National Infrastructure Pipeline document, almost out of the 1 lakh crore that has been outlined as a part of the spend, uh, four key sectors which government has identified that it's going to spend uh, which almost constitute 71% of the so total spend are the road, rail, uh, urban infrastructure and energy sector and all these four sectors are something that you have watched very closely. So let's kind of focus on these four sectors one by one and then probably look at the financing options. So the first question to uh, 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 you Ashish is that in terms of the road sector the government is almost going to uh, say that it's spending up till 18% of the NIP uh, numbers on the road sector actually which is like almost 20 lakh crores. Uh, from your perspective what are the short term and the long term challenges that you uh, see in the road sector? Right. See, uh, road sector, uh, if you look at the last five, six years, the uh, year on year awards for construction of roads has generally gone up. Uh, there has been an uh, issue in the last couple of years in terms of the right model in which the awards should be made. Uh, let me just recap the three main ways in which Government of India awards these contracts today. So the first one is a built operate transfer model where the private entity essentially builds the road operates, collects the tolls, uh, recoups its investment and then transfers the asset back to the government which can then decide to uh, toll it or not toll it etc depending on the prevailing situation. There is the hybrid annuity model where the government pays say about half or so 60 percent of the uh, rather 40 percent of uh, the uh, the cost of the project in say three, four, five installments to the uh, to the developer. The rest is paid on uh, on an annuity basis, depending on what is the performance of the operator in terms of managing that asset or how Absolutely. well is that asset being ma maintained. Uh, the third is the conventional EPC contracts where the government essentially spends all the money upfront uh, or not upfront, but let's say all the money. It doesn't take uh, any financial uh, risk for the private sector uh, operator and the government then essentially uh, pays depending on the progress of the project. The The... The, the BOT model was not working very well because the, uh, the companies were uh, not in a very healthy financial condition. We've had significant uh, stress in the financial system, both in the lending side, on, on the, uh, in the, in the banking system, as well as on the NBFC side. So, so basically, the operators were not very happy with the BOT model. So they turned, government turned towards the HAM model in the last couple of years. It worked quite well for one year. But uh, what has happened since then in the last year is that uh, hardly any projects were awarded in the previous financial year under, under the hybrid annuity model. The, the, the reason here was that a uh, lot of financial closures never happened. I think out of the 128 projects awarded in the previous year, only 54 uh, achieved financial closure. And, and the reason was that a uh, lot of, lot of uh, players bid beyond what uh, you know, they could service in, in terms of uh, their capability to actually execute. And that... Uh, 
was not very uh, helpful for the banks or for the lending institutions. So they uh, did not fund these projects. Also because most of the contractors who are working in India have got uh, not so, I mean, they're not very big firms basically. So their ability to raise funding from the corporate bond market, etc. is also quite poor in general. Yes. So the HAM model also did not take off. So the government is now back to using, doing the usual stuff of, of EPC. Now the challenge with EPC is that while in theory government doesn't, uh, I mean government assumes all the risk. The, the challenge here is that a uh, lot of the payments are done on the completion milestones. And uh, let's say for, uh, let's say a road is, a road is awarded, uh, a, a vendor does 90% of the job and 10% remains pending because of some land acquisition issues or some local leader, a local politician doesn't want that project to be completed or let's say there's a court injunction against the project, you know, stuff like that. The project is not completed, the government will not pay the, uh, the, the, the vendor and hence the entire financial uh, situation of that vendor goes for a task. The working capital issues arise and then the future projects also get impacted. So basically uh, the, uh, the, the challenge in the road model, uh, while I think the, the, the fact is that the sector can absorb 20 lakh crore investment. I think that is okay, not so the, the issue. The potential is there. Certainly. The potential is certainly there, especially with the uh, Sagar Mala, Bharat Mala plans, which the which the ministry had uh, both for the roads linking ports as well as the roads generally crisscrossing Correct. India, uh, which were defined by trade. And I think some of the definitions are very interesting. Like for example, Surat to Chennai highway. Like we have never thought about these things because I mean both despite Surat and Chennai being great trading centers and a lot of cargo moving on half as hardly on rail, railway, I mean, in, in, on, on rail or on roads on uh, ill-defined highways. Uh, there's no direct road today from Surat to Chennai. Or for example, there was a proposal to create something from Punjab, uh, Lodhiana industrial belt into the Jamnagar port so that Punjab can get a dry, I mean, there could be dry port in Lodhiana or somewhere else in Punjab, but it gets access to the port in Jamnagar. So ideas have, are very good. I think that the sector can easily absorb a 20 lakh crore uh, investment over the next five years. Uh, in terms of what the need is, but the fact is that the ability to, of the government to award projects worth 20 lakh crores and then the ability to, of contractors to actually execute them uh, is, 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 a, is a challenge. Now, if the government only so uses... So do you EPC, think there is a healthy pipeline of shovel ready projects or that might be a challenge actually that like say government wants to turn on the engine say a couple of months from now, do you think there are enough shovel ready projects actually? So, uh, th that's another challenge. I think uh, if you look at NIP in general, about 40% of the projects are today on the drawing board or on, in some early stages of execution. 60% of the projects in general, it is not just roads, but whatever is there in NIP is essentially conceptual. So even to take, get, take them off, which is essentially means you have to do the bidding, you have to do the tendering process, find the right contractors. The, the, the challenge with the current structure is that our entire model, and again, nothing to do with the roads, but the entire government procurement model is based on the L1 bidding criteria. Now, what happens is that, see, you can promise to execute something at a low price, but your ability to actually deliver uh, and ability to raise fund has got nothing to do with your promise of keeping the cost on a given project low, right? So, I mean, essentially your balance sheet has got no relation to your execution ability in the future. So, if, if you can't even raise funds uh, from the market for your working capital or for ongoing uh, requirements of a project, there's no point in selecting an L1 bidder. And I think that's a challenge which the road firms will face in a, in a big way. I mean, that's because there are very few companies, there are 15, 20, let's say contractors who can do things well. They're already doing multiple projects multiple and projects. Uh, anyone who has come in, in the sector afresh, I mean, even large companies like let's say SL Group or JP or some of the generally well-known firms otherwise have actually burned fingers in a big way. I mean, uh, Anil Amani's uh, group, the, the Reliance ADAG on, on, the, on the infra side. So they've, they've not fared well. So the thing is, if these people also cannot fare well, then the chance of getting, let's say, a mid-sized developer to diversify into road construction is, is very, very little. And I think that is the limiting factor here. So the, the throughput is limited by the number of people who can execute projects worth 20 lakh crores. The country needs projects and I think they can easily be identified also. It's just that the, the execution ability is pretty low. Uh, NHAI also... I mean, another option is NHAI can raise bonds, but they've already done quite a bit. And I think they, they, it's one of the most, um, I mean, they were one of the earliest players to tap, uh, you know, funding on, uh, funding by other means of balance sheet items. But uh, I think there's a limit we have reached there. So uh, 20 lakh crores right now looks ambitious, but uh, let's say if we can unlock the, the 
let's say selling of highways in a package creating uh, investment you know the uh, the, the invitees etc which which package road assets i think that still a model which which can fully play out over the next 5 years we've just explored that the first contract which went to one of the firms was just about a billion dollars in in size so it was not very big but uh, uh, i mean relative to what the investment needed is so uh, i think that the, the possibility is open but it, it's it's a bit of a challenge okay uh, ashish uh, so from roads uh, let's move on to the railway sector which which is again something that you know you have followed with a great deal of interest and also return uh, so extensively so for the railways i think the pipeline looks like uh, in terms of the funding that the nip estimates is something like 13 lakh crore plus actually uh, so uh, you know uh, how do you think um, uh, railway uh, you know do you think that is the kind of money that would be sufficient to uh, kick start the railway uh, projects see railway uh, probably the situation is a little different and 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 better because the unbundling of projects in railways can happen at a project level itself you don't need one single model to do everything what railway need, uh, is, is is trying to do right so for example uh, let's say the private trains which we have written about in swaraj quite a bit and i think swaraj covered even quite extensively uh, in december uh, uh, let's so so you can raise resources through fairly uh, un- i mean you can unbundle specific things and raise resources and i think that still works for railway so like private trains is a, it was a good example where the niti ayog made a report about uh, launching you know 150 private trains across different r- routes and like i think two or three of them are already operational where irctc was uh, the the first vendor i mean it's not strictly private in the sense of uh, the fact that irctc is also a ir subsidiary but but uh, it's corporatized and a uh, lot of other uh, players were also vying for this content and carriage separation effectively so uh, i'm more hopeful on the railways being able to raise the funding because they can do it do a more targeted job and the source of funding could be fairly different so for example the station redevelopment projects now of course in the current environment the real estate prices will likely crash so uh, maybe the uh, project awards may get delayed or the execution may get delayed by a couple of quarters until the real estate market settles down but um, i think that that's that's a fairly close knit uh, model in itself i mean in the sense that the railway can lease out land at a you know whatever 99 years or whatever model they are trying and then they essentially let a developer come in and uh, redo a station and then uh, lend you know the, that area can become a commercial hub of activity and the, the 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 developer can run it like a mall or like a shopping premises and so on and then essentially keep servicing the uh, lease rentals to the railways so uh, railways has got much a uh, slightly easier task in the sense that they can look at uh, the pipeline they can refresh it based on the current situation and because they have a lo- lot of unlocking potential through uh, involving corporates uh, i think their investment of 25 lakh crore sort which is there in the pipeline should be more realistic and uh, should be doable okay that's great ashish so the next sector uh, is in terms of what it broadly call the urban infrastructure which includes urban transportation ur- urban housing uh, see uh, this sector especially becomes very important in light of the recent pandemic Uh, if you really look at the covid-19 in india at least is a certain urban health crisis largely li- uh, linked to the fact that social distancing is not possible in places like say mumbai or large parts of delhi and some of our big cities actually you know and uh, also the transportation urban transportation in india is uh, still a challenge actually in terms of you know uh, i mean of course we don't have the delhi metro type of model virtually in other cities mumbai for instance uh, for the scale of the travel that the people have to undertake the urban transport infrastructure is little appalling so given that our greatest challenge is to provide uh, better housing and transportation in the urban sector uh, the nip funding for the urban projects it's at like 17% which is which is almost like 20 lakh crore do you think that will be sufficient or given india's urbanization ambitions this might fall way short sure uh, in my personal view uh, when i wrote about the nip also was that i think the the urban sector was the least op- least uh, uh, optimistic projection of what the nip talked about and i think the least ambitious uh, part of the of the whole report 
see uh, the the whole urban sector has got three four different parts so let's look at let's look at it one by one by one right so one is that if you look at our conventional thinking of how the cities have been developed we say that our fsi in large cities is like 1.5 to 2.5 while the bigger cities like new york or hong kong or tokyo may even go till 5 so we have actually been an advocate of more densely populated urban areas and we have actually been arguing the other way around so far contrary to what the pandemic uh, needs which is that our urban planning is not dense enough now what the pandemic is teaching you is that yes potentially that may be the case but a dense urban planning may fail to stop a tail event or uh, i mean a, like a black swan event like 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 a pandemic like this right so now the challenge here is that uh you have to first decide what philosophy to follow are you saying that we will india will continue to promote more urbanization and when i say urbanization the top 8 10 cities or will india need to develop new cities or expand uh more peripheral cities i mean the tier 2 cities and two slightly bigger cities i would say that the policy makers will start thinking of the second option more rather than getting i mean of course this doesn't doesn't mean that uh, a mumbai or a bangalore or a delhi doesn't need to be improved it it certainly does and i think uh, certainly in F- fsi 1.5 is atrocious for a city like mumbai even if it's not 5 i mean 1.52 is quite atrocious in itself so uh, i think the one set of investments and i think the nip will have to relook at this is to see how we can do the whole rehabilitation slash redevelopment of housing in the urban in 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 some key cities some of them uh, pretty much all models in mumbai have not worked out very well be dharavi be the bdd chols uh the fatnavis government tried quite hard to solve both the problems but they lingered uh the current government has also floated tenders and things are still settling down for them the the, the challenge is that there is no right way to uh deal with this invest i mean what is the yield for the guy who's investing so it is quite possible that the government may have to assume much higher mantle of doing a slum redevelopment type of a project mm-hmm. and it may now become a public health requirement as well and not just an urbanization requirement so i think that right. is one type of projects which they should look at different cities uh, mumbai being the prime example but could also be kolkata bangalore chennai delhi but and, and, and identify areas which can be re- redeveloped yeah ha- having said that the redevelopment cannot be so dense that you cannot deal with the pandemic so now then the, then comes the second question as to which cities do you pick up to uh, develop uh, further uh, existing city so that i would probably identify 15 20 next industrial areas uh which which they can invest in and attract people or incentivize people to move to those cities so that is right, the right. second part the third part is that maybe and when the smart cities mission was launched in june 2016 uh this was a expectation and we didn't take it didn't take off because of obviously the funding needed for that but maybe india now needs just new cities i mean maybe we just need five or six like if not mega cities at least fairly large well planned uh you know brown, industrial uh, engines yeah greenfield if not brownfield cities just just to essentially kick start it, i mean obviously it will kick start the economic activity plus uh incentivize people to move to a completely fresh uh, uh place right so uh, there's a talk that uh, alongside the the industrial corridor which is the railways is doing between on the, on the western side uh the, and on, also on the uh mumbai delhi highway with the the new uh, the new express which is coming up between delhi and mumbai uh between them there will be some five new cities in, in maharashtra mp rajasthan haryana and so on so that is one option uh which government in my view should certainly look at afresh uh, and and prioritize because prioritize uh, there's a chance to create industrial cities or at least trading cities if not industrial cities and uh, which now the, the challenge here is that indian uh, challenge to all those three problems actually is is the indian political structure uh, the federalism here in my view is now getting counterproductive uh there are far too many controls and far too many uh egos to massage for any investor in in such projects because the projects can be held uh for ransom at, at multiple levels right i mean if a corporator is not happy versus an mla is not happy versus an opposition mla or mp is not happy versus the delhi government is not happy a lot of things may happen so i think this uh maybe it needs new regulation uh where the central government i mean it could maybe it's like a ut kind of a thing where government buys land one time and then develops them like a union territory and then hands over to the state government to manage it later correct uh, uh, ashish later. on the you covered on the housing part uh, on the urban transportation part because that might be a very interesting uh, situation now because at least i see that for the next one 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 year uh, people might be little wary of you adopting public transport in a big way 
so do you think that this gives an opportunity for the government to kind of scale up on say bu- rapidly building metros in some of the cities because already i think there were like healthy constructions happening of metros across various indian cities how do you think or maybe this might not be a policy priority now or how do you think how do you think this is going to play out actually well, and i was going to come to that actually as, as a last point on the urban sector in fact i i think prasanna this is a huge opportunity and we should not think of it in the next 6 months view see the thing is uh, what what are we talking about we are saying that if people are able to commute to their uh, business areas uh, without having to live in the business areas uh, 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 that that is what we really want right and that, that actually needs efficient public mass public transport so rather than scaling down on those projects we should double down on those projects and in fact extend the connectivity and scope of these projects so for example the project which there which uh, around delhi which is like the rapid rail uh, which connects delhi to meerut saharanpur you know areas like those i think that that these are phenomenal projects i mean if if you can actually commute to delhi in say uh, say 90 minutes from meerut why do you want to live in delhi and still commute 90 minutes in a uh, you know a cab or a uh, or, or even in a metro for that matter right so 60 minutes in a metro so uh, the, the fact is that uh, the urban transportation and also the other thing to consider prasanna here is that urban transportation we are catching up i mean what we have today is not even sufficient for say 1970 so there's no point of canning it in 2020 saying there'll be no takers in Correct. 2021 i mean you're solving the 1970 problem so let's first get into 2020 and then say that okay fine you can scale down on a 2030 requirement which i think makes sense but so there's no point in cutting down on expenditure right now uh, like the mumbai 340 km metro project should have been live by now right and since it is not uh, this is a great time to actually complete it and uh, and uh, ensure that all bottlenecks ar- around uh, the environmental clearances and the political uh, issues which have muddled the construction uh, actually are taken care of so i would say that nip should double down on uh, uh, public transport not just for the top 6 7 metros but also for the say, 20 25 cities uh, which allows people to come to the cities work and then go back home on on the same evening in in, in a 60 to 90 minute window so that people don't have to live in those cities which will solve the other problem of urbanization being too dense and and too uncontrolled absolutely so let's move to the sector which uh, has probably the maximum uh, allocation as per the plan of the national infrastructure uh, sector about which probably it's also your sweet spot in terms of you know you've written so copiously about it the energy sector as they call it so almost uh, 27 lakh crore is what is the kind of spend that nip is projecting for the energy sector over the next uh, uh, 5 years uh, so can you help us like uh, you know can you highlight like how this spend can be channel is so that there is the best uh, bank for the buck as they say actually in the uh, energy sector sure see the energy sector again let's take it in two parts the oil and gas part and the power uh, the, the, the the utilities part of it right so uh, on the oil and gas side uh, i think the prospects are pretty bright uh, the fact is that uh, projects like city gri- city gas grids which we are creating the uh, Uh, the investments which gale has made or some of the other private players like adani have made i think they are very useful projects these are uh, first of all i mean it makes india a gas based economy uh, moves away from uh, the, the the lesser uh, for, for fossil fuel fuels for that matter uh, also uh, it helps us to uh, create new jobs in situ jobs because these are grids which are being set up and wherever they are being set up right so you don't have to move to cities to uh, and to to run those grids and because the grids will run forever the jobs will also be permanent in nature right so these are uh, the 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 com- the maintenance jobs and the commissioning jobs etc will will stay i mean it's not a one time activity basically so the whole gas based economy which we had started to invest in i think i hope that that continues i mean a lot of work has happened in on the eastern side and of course in some cities in maharashtra and gujarat but rest of the country should uh, i mean we should prioritize that that area that, that part so that that i i i'm hopeful that uh, that market will continue to remain attractive in fact again uh, it becomes even more attractive because uh, it gives you an option to uh, move away from fossil fuels and it's got an import uh, uh, you know uh, i mean import cut uh, advantage there as well that you don't import as much oil so long term it is very very beneficial uh, on the power side uh, there's a lot of regulatory muddle which still needs to be cleared and the reason is that uh, i mean i've written about this in the in swaraj but say when udaya was launched as a program to solve the issues of the discoms 
a lot of states eventually i mean they did a good job for one one and a half years and then i think the things uh, fizzled out i mean the states stopped cooperating uh, etc so the discoms some discoms improved but um, they haven't institutionally improved in the sense that they have gone back to wherever they used to be right and now, now the challenge here is that uh, the whole structure is very complex uh, we have 370 odd uh, uh, gig gigs of uh, generating capacity but uh, the usage the peak usage is you know 1 125 130 let's say uh, on on any given day uh, the the challenge is now uh, how do you keep the private players invested uh, interested in those projects which is very difficult uh, yes the renewable side is still okay because the government can still incentivize and make it mandatory for the states to purchase renewable energy and so on uh, so you can still keep running the solar and the wind projects to some extent but there are other issues to resolve around transmission around uh, you know grid integration uh, who pays for uh, uh you know frequency fluctuations uh, how how do you adjust for that in the in the entire setup how do you create large solar parks where are where is the land uh, are states really giving land at a, at a at a reasonable price do you manufacture solar panels when uh you know the uh, the, the equipment for wind power in india you know stuff like that i mean what is what are import duties do we have the manufacturers for that so i think all of all of those issues need to be resolved on the before some of these projects take off on the generation side uh what certainly can be done and uh you know a crisis always is a chance to create reforms and i think i hope some states use this as an opportunity to give away their discoms to private players uh we just saw in a, on a different note that an mp uh, uh cm shivraj singh chauhan announced sweeping agricultural reforms now apmc reforms were not happening but now when there's a crisis the state and he has he's in the right political situation it's a goldilocks situation for him it's it's not to warm not to cold uh, he has some competition internally but will government will survive after his coup in uh, bhopal so the fact is that he used that moment to uh, run a sweeping uh, sort of reforms on in agriculture the same needs to happen in power because the challenge here is that central government can only do so much in 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 power i mean you can say that okay fine we will install smart meters you can even procure small smart meters as part of the nip projects and install them but what if it doesn't it doesn't get used i mean what what if the state discom is just corrupt some state discom is just completely corrupt and just bypasses that mechanism correct. and says that we will not charge the customers right stuff like that so there are certain some interventions which the state government can drive one one example could be that the state the sorry the central government can uh, can disintermediate the agriculture grid and make solar pumps mandatory there that would help us create a solar pumps solar power infrastructure for one part of the economy which is, which is agriculture but to for them to clean up everything especially which involves state discoms is going to be very, very difficult unless states reform and uh, that has not been i mean it's proved to be hurdle because even states which have announced reforms like rajasthan uh, uh it there was a lot of political opposition the government which announced the reforms lost when yogi adityanath came in up with a humongous mandate i mean he's got what 75% of the seats even he, he couldn't try, he announced reforms in the scom sector and immediately after one week he had to roll it back because there was so much opposition so so the challenge here is that even the best of the administrators or the best of the politicians with political mandate will also find it difficult, difficult so power sector uh, like roads i would say uh, there's a lot to be done but there's a lot to be untangled as well uh, and it's a little bit more, more complex than the uh, than roads because no one government can push for it uh, in roads at least the central government can still solve for it uh, power it needs a lot of it will need a lot of state cooperation roughly about 40% of all expenditure today or let's say the power economies in the states uh, so it, it it's a big dependency for the central government okay so uh, ashish the last question the the most uh, important question is in terms of funding the nip actually you know like uh, uh, you know 1.1 lakh crore is a staggering amount it's like almost half of uh, india's nominal uh, gdp and uh, you know and of course it's going to be the spend is going to be over the next 4 5 years and uh, uh, to be hon- uh, fair the document kind of gives some broad indications about how this spending is going to happen so around 20% by the central government around 20 to 25% by the states then some of the psus especially in the uh, power and digital infrastructure space spend around 3 4% so almost 50% by government and psus but almost 50% from private sector largely you raise it through debt equity bond market nbfcs and all that uh, so it's essentially again uh, in a certain way a ppp 
model of execution actually on which traditionally india has not uh, successfully been able to uh, you know master that game so as to speak so what do you uh, what are the challenges that you kind of you know see in terms of financing the national infrastructure pipeline sure so again there are two parts to this one is let's let's look at the nip from a contribution of central states and the private players uh we are roughly talking about 35 35 30 i mean there could be some differences uh, but that is a rough division the center expects to put in one third the states expect to um, are expected to put the other one third and the remaining is with the private players now in the current situation where states are facing uh, revenue pressure i mean so is the center but center probably has got a little bit more cushion but states are talking about bankruptcy i mean you know we, we already had a point where states several states have asked for money from center uh specifically to fight covid and then of course um, uh that hence they will cut down on expenditure elsewhere so i think the ability of states to spend 35% or one third of let's say 40 lakh crores uh, effectively uh is suspect i mean they, it's not that they can't uh, if, if you actually look at the run rate states were probably the best place because if you look at the last years or this years this financial years uh, i mean the, the completed financial years figure uh um, the state cap capex the central capex was about 3 lakh crores the states in to, to, in total were about 9 lakh crores so theoretically speaking 45 lakh crores can come from the states but in the in today's uh contribution uh, will will states deprioritize of course they will and they will also hand over i mean they will also uh, hold uh, center to ransom in terms of uh if they they'll say that if you expect us to do certain projects and you fund it i mean or, or you take a risk in uh, of 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 execution so uh the centers 40 lakh crores is a little bit iffy i mean that's one area to watch out for uh now again the iffiness can come from purely the money not being there and then secondly the intent not being there so there's a political problem and there's a economic problem i think the economic problem can still be solved to the extent that uh more borrowings or more targeted borrowings or uh raising bonds for specific projects which are serviced via the cash flow of the project itself and all of that can be explored but politically i find it a little uh difficult that the states will cooperate at least in the near term in the next one two years things may improve later on but let's say the first couple of years uh, may be difficult from a states contribution standpoint now if you look at the entire uh 1 lakh let's say 1 lakh 20000 crores in, which is the number in the most recent version 1110 120 uh actually it's not uh, while the number looks daunting uh, actually that's not the case on the on the run rate basis so for example india is anyway doing 12 12 lakh crores in capex type activities so that 60 crores is anyway by a government Correct. and uh, let's say the psus can contribute another say 8 to 10 lakh crores so say 70 70 can be done now the how do you generate other 50 including the private players that, that is what the question is right and of course private players are also deleveraging because they've also got a twin balance sheet uh, issue issue to deal with i mean banks are, are in lending and they their own balance sheets are are, are stressed so uh, as such uh, i would say that realistically it was achievable without the additional stress that we are dealing with maybe we could have undershot it by say 10 15% but the the target was doable and if okay. things improved uh, it could have been a balloon model where the first two years were not 20 lakh crores i mean it, it's not uniform 20 lakh crores but basically you start with say 12 to 15 lakh crores in the first year and then you move towards 30 40 in the towards the tail end so it the, it was doable but again not a lot will depend on the how the things evolve from here and how quickly the economy recovers from the current shock correct uh, so some uh, uh, sorry to interject ashish so do you see a significant part of the money obviously has to come from say a sticky for i mean a sticky kind of foreign capital like say you know the sovereign wealth funds and uh, you know the pension funds which have shown some inclination but you know uh, do you think that uh, now with all the pandemic situation uh, they will be willing to put in money uh, in uh, countries like india actually so i, I would say that the first uh, couple of years prasanna the significant amount has to come from the center uh, okay. i okay. i front I don't loading think, yeah exactly i mean the center has to front load the the numbers may not be front loaded but center's contribution has to be front loaded so so the numbers may uh, ramp up towards the end but i think the central contribution or the central direction has to be fast but there's another challenge here right so for example if you have to run a 20 lakh 20 lakh crore worth of projects you need to have a pipeline of 70 80 lakh thousand crores to run a 20 lakh crore project in a given year why because a pro- uh, like a road will take 3 4 years to complete uh, a, a rail project will take 5 years to complete uh, you know uh, a creation of a new city you can do let's say in over 5 years 
So you need to have a fairly healthy 70, 80 lakh crore pipeline on a yearly basis of which 20 can be realized each year. Now the challenge is with the 70, 80 is that uh, one is of course the funding part, but also it's also the bureaucratic part of it, right? Because if you're, if you're going to take two years for environmental clearances, etc., uh, that model cannot work when you are uh, need to invest or need to put capex in is here and now. So that is the other challenge. I mean, the, the fact that NIP only has 40% of the projects currently on table or under execution and 60% yet to kick off, uh, government will have to do something to kick, the, kick these projects off. I mean, even if you can kick them off today and you can still complete it in 2025 and that, that's fine. But that pipeline has to become significantly larger, larger, uh, larger. Than, than what it is today because otherwise, uh, the uh, I mean, you can have one or two good years, but then otherwise things will fizzle out. And this then calls for reforms on the administrative side in terms of how the approvals are made, uh, how quickly things uh, uh, are addressed when a private pair has a problem. Can government pay its contractors on time? So those questions will come under uh, scrutiny uh, if we were to actually realize the dream. I, I'm still, I think, I still think it's it's not too way off. I mean, we may undershoot a little bit, but I think it's a great plan overall. And it helps to identify targeted projects to invest in. But the task is a little bit more difficult than it was in December when the document was first written. In the, in the last three months, of course, things have changed because of uh, COVID and hence the additional pressure to find near-term funding. It's been, it's been. Yeah. Okay, Ashish, on that uh, uh, note, uh, uh, we've come to the end of the discussion. Uh, hope to, uh, you know, have an, another round of discussion with you on NIP as uh, we get more clarity about how it uh, progresses. Thank you so much for the time, Ashish. Thank uh, you, Prasanna. Thanks for having me. With you.